Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Laura Prada from the Telesur Studios here in Caracas, Venezuela. We begin with our news. You stay with us. We begin in Ecuador because while massive march by indigenous people and other organizations have been heavily repressed in Quito's historic center, tens of thousands of demonstrators made their way peacefully through the historic center as Ecuador held a national strike against the government's austerity measures. This is the seventh day of protest against the economic package, which is part of President Lenis Moreno's deal with the International Monetary Fund. In the last two days, indigenous marshes have coverage on the capital from the north and the south. They've been joined by students, social movements and ordinary citizens angry at the fuel price rises and cuts in workers' rights. As the march moves close to the presidential palace, they were met with tear gas dispersed by police. And for the first time since demonstrations began seven days ago, water cannons were used. Some of the protesters responded with stones. On Tuesday, the government imposed an overnight curfew prohibiting people from being in the vicinity of government buildings. According to authorities, about 700 people have been detained so far, and there are reports that at least two people have died. Leaders of the main indigenous movement, CONAIE, have half-fatally rejected remarks by Ecuador's Vice President Otto Sonnenholzner about possible negotiations. On social media, they said it was untrue that CONAIE leaders were in touch with the government at the United Nations office in Ecuador. They said, we are with our members in the streets of the historic center of Quito, these members of the CONAIE movement said. Well, I think that uh, austerity policies, uh, the package, El Paquete, how it is called here of President Moreno, has, uh, well, um, and, and, the, and, the, and the state of deception that he has declared has closed down all the uh, ways of uh, a democratic resolution of this uh, conflict. So now the streets of Quito are the only place where people can express their demands and their position, their political positions because there's no other way to, to talk here in Ecuador. I mean, this democracy is under threat with President Moreno. That's what is going on now in Ecuador. And from the ground, in hold up with number of protesters, after they were attacked by police during demonstrations, our correspondents were in the streets of Quito, in the central, historical center of Quito, and they had the opportunity to speak with the following people. We were peacefully marching when police officers started attacking us. They didn't care that there were women and children present at the march. They threw tear gas canister at us. We tried to run away, but several of us tripped out and got it. They didn't have any respect for anyone. Those of us who are here today are not receiving money to be part of this protest. We are here because we are damaging President Moreno's resignation. We want him to leave power. We came here to peacefully protest against this corrupt government, and police officers ambushed us and attacked us from many directions. They didn't care about the fact that there were many women present at the march. We need help. People around the world need to understand what we are demanding. We demand this government leave power. All of these people who are marching and protesting demand the resignation of the president who has violated our rights. And one of our mates, our correspondent, Tefania Bravo, who has been all day long this Wednesday at the historic center of Quito, sent us the following report with the update and the situation. How was living lived the protest, these manifestations at the historic center of Quito? Welcome, Estefania. 
Hello, we are here in the capital Quito in the city center. It is approximately 3.57 p.m. And as you can see, we are here with various social movements that have come together to the center of Quito to protest against the economic measures of President Lenin Moreno. It is almost 4 p.m. in the afternoon and people here, I have talked to various people here and they have uh, told me and they have talked to me and said that um, this march is not is not pro any, any political party, it is against President Lenin Moreno and the economic measures. What we are about to see is the people that are protesting that have taken that have taken the streets. The police has been violently has uh, repressed violently um, against these people. And yes, right now we are in the in the, top, in the top of a bridge, so we can see the streets very clearly. We are in the center of Quito, and we are expecting to see what will happen in the coming hours. We we also know that there's a curfew that starts at 8 p.m local time so at 8 p.m local time um, people marching people that are on the streets will be taken out by the police the curfew starts at 8 p.m and it remains until 5 a.m so we will continue to update you with any information that we think Thank you, Estefania. That was Estefania Bravo from the streets, the historical center of Quito. Now we keep moving on about the information in Ecuador. And protests against economic package has also taken place in Ecuador's second city, the city of Guayaquil, where police fired tear gas at this peaceful march as well. President Lenin Moreno moved the government to Guayaquil as the indigenous marches approached the capital Quito. But indigenous communities from the coastal region have also arrived to Guayaquil in order to join protests with social movements. It affects my own pocket because I have to fill my tank twice a week. Each tank full costs $15 more. That's $30 extra a week. Over the whole year, that's $1,500. That means the health and education of my family, our vacations, and then the civil servants over here who are having 50 days pay taken away. That means they are eliminating the end of year bonus salary. People aren't stupid, President Moreno. Please change course, stop these measures. And even though President Lenny Moreno returned to Quito, marches continue in the city of Guayaquil. Our correspondent Carla Gonzalez is in Guayaquil and she's from Guayaquil also and she sent us the following reports with the latest information of what is happening underground. Welcome Carla, please. The protests continue in downtown Guayaquil. They haven't taken other roads because today both marches against and in favor of the national strike have been going on here in Nueva de Octubre Avenue. But for the indigenous march, which is also a gathered by campesinos, by students, by artists, they have been met with police repression. We've seen dogs, motorcycles, horses, and a lot of uh, repression by the police for, of course, rounds of tear gas that have also been thrown at protesters. They have not allowed them to enter the main street, the main avenue of the city. Meanwhile, we see on the back that we have the march that was called by the, uh, the mayor, uh, Cynthia Viteri. The municipal uh, workers are here. They are uh, rejecting what they say is a threat against Guayaquil because they say that if the indigenous march enters the city, it will create chaos, which uh, coincidentally, uh, the march has entered the city, not in a large number as it did in Quito, but it has entered the city of Guayaquil. And now we are seeing how this march had complete, um, had complete uh, avenues that were open. There wasn't any repression for their part. They were able to walk. There were no tear gas on this side of the road, but on the other one where the indigenous march is happening, they have been met with strong force by police. Thank you, Carla. That was Carla Gonzalez from the city of Guayaquil. And protesters in the Amazonian province of Napo, also in Ecuador, have elected their own indigenous governor. Indigenous organizations and other social movements took over the governor's office in the capital, provincial capital of Tena. They said they were sacking the current governor as a Moreno traitor and held a community assembly in order to elect a new governor. He is Patricio Chihuango, the president of the Indigenous Federation of Napo. Yeah, 
and Ecuadorians in the United States have also been protesting against the International Monetary Fund pushed authority measures. A number of Ecuadorians entered the office of the IMF Special Representative in the United Nations in New York in order to reject their government's deal with the organizations which will disproportionately affect the working class. Carrying banners and the indigenous plurinational flag, the protesters call for the IMF to take its hands off Ecuador. With this information, we go to a first break here in From the South. Remember, you can follow us on our social media on Twitter. You find us as at Telesur English and on my account at Laura P. Telesur. You stay with us. Enjoy the best content in spaces where you will discover new perspectives, innovation, well-being, conservation, equity, traditions, a wide variety of contents that you will find on Telesur the news source of Latin America and the Caribbean. Para mantenerme saludable, yo corro. To keep myself healthy, I study. Para mantenerme saludable, yo corro. To keep myself healthy, I study. Para mantenerme saludable, yo bailo. Para mantenerme saludable, yo purifico mi espíritu a través del cuerpo. ¿Y tú? Get your body. Tuesdays, only on Telesur. We are back with our news. This Wednesday, United Nations Refugee Agency offices were surrounded by 200 refugees who condemned violence against them in Cape Town, South Africa. Refugees from more than seven South African countries gathered to demonstrate against the violence they suffer. Eating from the dustbin, discrimination and insecurity are part of the current problems for our refugees in South Africa, which offers them no guarantee for a future. As a result, they have asked to relocate the two other countries. We are here because we notice now, xenophobia started from 2008 to say, now it's going west again. Because now it's official of this country. Ministers are calling for the hatred, discrimination. We are here because as, as a foreigner, refugee in this country, we don't have dignity. There is a discrimination we are facing each and every single day, everywhere. That means as refugees are no longer feel, are feeling safe in the community where they live. So they need to be located, relocated from South Africa to another country where they can feel safe and see whether they can get hope for future. In Tunisia, after parliamentary elections, the moderate Islamist Ahmada will be the largest party in Tunisia's new parliament, according to preliminary official results of the Wednesday, October 9th. But with only 52 of the 217 seats, he may have difficulty building a ruling coalition. However, the results are still subject to appeal. 
Tayao Democratic Current 22 seats, Karama The Dignity Coalition 21 seats, Free Constitutional Party 17 seats, The Echeva People's Movement 16 seats, Tanyan Tunis Long Live Tunis 14 seats, Macro Tunis Movement The Tunis Project 4 seats. The committee's position has been clear since the beginning. There can be equal opportunities when one candidate is buried. But today, this has changed, and they have both become equal. They have an opportunity to campaign within the next 48 hours. Presidential candidate Nebel Karawi has been released from prison four days before second round of the presidential elections. Karawi was detained in August before the first round of the elections and has spent the entire campaign period in prison pending a verdict in his trial for money laundering and tax evasion. He participated in the just and that parliamentary elections where no clear winner emerged. Polling stations will open to Tunisians for the third time in a month on Sunday for the presidential runoff. And the Turkish military has arrived at the Syrian border. The military convoy with uh, war tanks reached Syria and drove along the border, crossing into the northern side of the country. This marks the beginning of ground operations after having attacked Kurdish militia positions in northeast Syria with air strikes and barrage in a cross-border military operation. And all this just days after United States troops pulled back from the area. Meanwhile, the Kurdish-led forces said it will not target Turkey, but stands ready to face any kind of attack. A spokesman also called on the United Nations, European Union and democratic countries to oppose the Turkish incursion, saying failure to do so would be an endorsement of the move. And now we go to the Caribbean. Jamaica's former education minister, Rural Raid, and his wife, along with president of the Caribbean Maritime University, CMU, Fritz Pinnock, have all been arrested. They were held in relation to a corruption probe regarding a multi-million dollar fraud scheme at the Ministry of Education. CMU and other government entities which fell under Raid's portfolio as minister. Around five 30 a.m. local time police raided their homes in an operation conducted simultaneously in Kingston, St. Catherine and St. Raid and St. Anne. Raid resigned from government on March 20th, while Pinnock was sent on special leave with immediate effect on Tuesday this week. And data collected from the house-to-house -house registration process in Guyana is expected to be fully encoded by Elections Commission's GCOM by next week, Tuesday. This as the country readies itself for general elections on March 2, 2020. GCOM has processed more than 2,000 new registrations over the past week that the claims and objections process have been ongoing. Going forward, the chief elections officer will prepare a report for public scrutiny. Claims and objections will end on October 11th. And listen to this. A case of modern-day slavery was unearthed in Trinidad and Tobago as the police service rescued 69 citizens who were in prison at his church in Arauca, East Trinidad. 65 women, men and four women, some of whom were handcuffed, shared bunk beds in tiny cages and received meals through a small opening. The police commissioner described the rescue people as a slave, adding that the relative paid for their institutionalization. A total of six people have so far been arrested, including the pastor of the so-called Rehabilitation Center for Human Trafficking. We have now cracked probably what is one of the biggest situations pertaining to human trafficking in this country. Um, we have been losing the DPP. There have been 65 men and four women that we have found held against their will. The will they have been in prison. They have been in cages. Some of them have stated that they've been here for a few years. 
Um, I have contacted the Minister of National Security, the Minister of Health. Um, this is a much bigger picture and, and we, we, we'll have to investigate each and every situation. Three people, people have been held at this time, one being a, a pastor, um, he's, he's being questioned. Um, this, this is on Eastern Main Road in Aruka. And what we have seen is that uh, this relates to virtual slavery, where persons have been in cages. Um, we've seen, we have reports from some of them that they have been tortured. Um, it, it is a much bigger picture where there's, there's profit that, uh, made out of this, and uh, where it, it involves family members deliberately selling their loved ones here and then trying to extract the profit from the family. And like this, we go to a second and very short break. You stay tuned with us. Discover the cultural diversity that defines a continent. The place where art and tradition are part of the same nucleus. Artistic expressions. Values. Fridays, only on this world. Πιστεύω ότι η μουσική μπορεί να σε κάνει να νιώθεις ακόμα και όταν είσαι άρρωστος, να νιώθεις πάρα πολύ καλά και την επόμενη μέρα να είσαι μια χαρά. We might not be able to talk together, but when we play, we know what we're saying to each other. We are back with our news after the dissolution of the opposition-led parliament. The government of the Peruvian president, Manuel Vizcarra, announced this Wednesday that it will not participate in next legislative elections scheduled for January 26 on 2020. Prime Minister Vicente Ceballos said that the government will maintain the, an opposition of neutrality when speaking at a press conference in Lima. We just finished the meeting of the Council of Ministers and we have already approved our first emergency decree, which is the finalized decree approving the measures for holding the election for a new Congress. This document will be published tomorrow. It's the first one and of great importance because uh, through this normative instrument we are authorizing the electoral system, comprising of the national jury renique, national register of identification and civil status, and OPE, National Office of Electoral Processes, to a regulatory rating that enables the elections already called for January 26, 2020, and so decreed by the Constitution. And Alvaro Uribe made history on Tuesday, becoming the first Colombian former president to, be, to testify before a Supreme Court on allegations including procedural fraud, extortions, and witness tampering that could lead him to criminal charges. 
a historic event for Colombian justice as the Supreme Court presented its case against ex-president and senator Álvaro Uribe Vélez. The former leader appeared before Colombia's highest court at 8 a.m. accompanied by his attorneys. He was received by a small group of sympathizers as well as many human rights organizations whose members held photos of victims killed by paramilitaries. Colombians are celebrating and marking this day of justice. At the same time, we are commemorating our dead, the victims killed specifically during Uribe's tenure between 2002 and 2010. Social leaders, ex-combatants and victims are all present. In 2012, Uribe sued left-leaning Senator Ivan Cepeda, whom he accused of hatching a plot to falsely link him to paramilitary groups. But the court instead opened an investigation into him for procedural fraud, witness tampering and extortion. Uribe, who is senator and the leader of current president Ivan Duque's Democratic Center Party, had to answer about 100 questions as part of the investigation. As a judge, I voice my support for the Supreme Court in this brief act because despite all the murderers, Alvaro Uribe was simoned. Even though he was not directly implicated for the massacres, this is the first step because as a citizen, I have been waiting for this more than half of my life. Justice to be served to one of the biggest criminals in Colombia. Human rights organizations, social collectives, victims' movements, and teachers' representatives assembled outside the court. They held posters accusing Uribe of mass murder, demanding justice and an explanation of his alleged link to paramilitaries. We, the Teachers' Union, know that Uribe Vélez has a lot to do with the issue of violence in Colombia. In the last 20 years, teachers have been killed simply for educating children on history by showing them how drug trafficking unions work with Colombia politicians and the parapolitical movements that lead to Álvaro Uribe. This hearing may be extended for several days. The court has a maximum of 10 days to decide whether it will indict Uribe, allowing him to attend court while being free, if the case is closed or if he will be sent to jail. And now we move on to other information. Candidates are set to win the up campaign ahead of the 2019 Canadian federal elections on October 21st to elect members of the House of Commons to Parliament. And our correspondent in Canada, Pablo Ivanko, has the details for us and he sent it to us on the following report. Welcome. Party leaders continue their campaigning ahead of the October 21st vote and Justin Trudeau is in the north in Nunavut talking climate change, Conservative leader Andrew Scheer and NDP leader Jagmeet Singh both in the greater Toronto area. Singh meeting with unions and students, Scheer in the suburbs uh, around the city hoping to pick up votes in those areas. Now after Monday's debate, the Conservatives seem to be on track uh, to uh, win in a minority government according to the latest polls uh, according to those polls that came out after the debate the conservatives uh, could be on route to win 152 seats compared to 117 for the liberals and 36 for the bloc quebecois uh, the ndp for its part is projecting to win up to 29 seats and four for the greens tomorrow will be the last debate that will feature all leaders and this will be in french Thank you, Pablo. And like this, we've come to the end of this with Prefab. Remember, you can follow us and the development of more information on our website, TelstarEnglish.net, where you can find opinion articles, watch the special interviews, and of course, follow the latest coverage we are making of the latest information developing in Latin America, the Caribbean, and the rest of the world by what is happening in Ecuador. As I always say, you continue with us with Telesur, connecting our global south. Until next time, thank you for watching.